Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm gonna talk about all the books I read in April. And right off the bat, I'm gonna apologize if you hear a chainsaw or noises in the background. There is somebody cutting down branches of a huge tree outside of our house. So I'm trying to, this is like the farthest room away from the house that I can try to film this, and this is the only day that I have to film. So here we are. Anyway, I read five books in the month of April. All five of them I got from my library. Three of them were audiobooks and two were physically read. So I'm gonna get started by sharing my least favorite to my favorite. And I do have two vlog videos where I talk about all of these books in here. So if you want a little bit more detail, I'll link those videos below to each specific book I'm talking about. So my least favorite book this month was a book that I physically read called Layla. And this is by Colleen Hoover. This is my very first Colleen Hoover book I've ever read. And to be honest, I hadn't really heard of her before this past year. Um, I wasn't totally into reading like before 2020, so that could be why. But I just was seeing her everywhere. She was on the Goodreads list. She was all over my library, so I decided to give her a try. So this book focuses on two characters named Leeds and Layla, and the story is told from the male character's point of view, which is Leeds. Leeds and Layla meet when they're at a wedding. Layla's sister is getting married and Leeds is the bass player in the wedding band and they meet each other, they fall in love. It's like a soulmate connection, instant attraction. Um, then something happens to Layla. She suffers an accident which leaves her with some uh, mental health trauma, some emotional trauma and some, a little bit of physical trauma as well. So the relationship drastically takes a change. This happens within a few months of them dating. And Leeds is just trying to come to grips with the new reality that is their relationship, both of them. So Leeds decides to plan a vacation where they go to the bed and breakfast where they met for a couple weeks just to rest and relax and to try to reconnect and get to know each other again. So they show up at this place and all these weird things start happening. Layla's behavior starts getting a little bit more bizarre than it usually is and weird things start happening throughout the house. So right away we're wondering, is there somebody in the house? Is there, you know, like a stranger there that's doing these weird things? Is there a paranormal element? Like what's going on? So up until that point of the book, I was really enjoying it. I thought that the writing was pretty good. I can see why Colleen Hoover is really popular. I think that her writing is really easy to read. It's bingeable and it's really quick to get through and turn pages. So I did really enjoy that part of the book. And some of this mystery going on was really interesting as well. Then as we get further into the story, I started to shake my head a little bit more like what is going on? And I think my main problem was with the character of Leeds. So he's written to be like this sweet, heartfelt musician. Um, totally in love. Right away we're getting like all these descriptions of Layla as being absolutely perfect looking physically. Um, she's quirky, she's fun, so it's just like she's he's putting her on this pedestal which is something that I, I kind of don't like in romance books. It's like when we're constantly being shoved with this like physically perfect person, like skinny but with curviness in the right places, perfect skin, perfect hair, perfect smile. It's just kind of like, bleh, you know, it's not real. So that kind of annoyed me off the front, off the, off the bat right away. And then the things going on with the paranormal part of things were really out there. I really love paranormal investigations. I mean, my husband and I watch them on YouTube all the time. We have tons of channels that we follow. So some of the paranormal elements that were happening were, were to me just a little bit over the top that I, I was like, you know, very unbelievable, hard to, you know, really connect with that part. Um, and the other section of the book that I really didn't like was the, there is a fair bit amount of emotional gaslighting physical abuse. It's physical torture not coming from an evil place, but it's coming from like, I just need to do this. I just need to like get through this. Like you need to just be here. Like for example, the book opens up and Layla is tied to a bed with duct tape over her mouth and we don't know why. So it's that kind of situation that is happening and I can't really get into it fully without spoiling the plot, but that for me, the way that she incorporated that into the story Ultimately, by the end, we there's some twists that are revealed, but I didn't feel as though Leeds' behavior with all of this manipulation and gaslighting and the treatment of Layla, 
I didn't feel like it really came together for me. I didn't feel like I wasn't rooting for them anymore. I wasn't rooting for the couple. I was not rooting for Leeds. I didn't care if he got his happy ending. I, it just really bothered me how she took this like crazy situation, twisted it up, and like marked like a romantic fantasy ending at the end of it. It just didn't sit well with me. Another thing that I didn't really like about this book was how it addressed the overall topic of brain injuries. So, spoil, minor spoiler, one of Layla's accident results in her having a brain injury. So she's going through some personality changes, some uh, PTSD issues, something that somebody with what, we sh with what she went through would be normal and it would take quite a long recovery. So she really took away from the reality of that and things resolved in such a pretty little picture that it didn't make sense to me. The ending was not viable. It was not believable to me. So that's another reason why I didn't really like the book. Now, a lot of people really liked this book. So if you're a Colleen Hoover fan, um, you might enjoy it. But if you are a little bit triggered by gaslighting and um, cheating, I will say, then this might not be the book for you. So overall, I gave it like story wise, probably two and a half stars. But because the writing was OK and that it was really page turnery, I did kind of waver around a three because I I can see why people probably like this author and I'd be willing to try another book by her. I'll give her one more chance. But from what I've listened to and read, um, she kind of puts a pretty little stamp on abuse. And uh, so I don't know if she's an author for me, but I am glad that I tried it. So real quickly, I'm also going to touch upon my second probably book in the lineup, which is The Last Battle by C.S. Lewis. And this is the seventh and final book in the Chronicles of Narnia series. So I did read all the books leading up to this, except for The Magician's Nephew, which technically is the prequel to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I wanted to save that for last because I did hear that that was a little bit better of a book than The Last Battle. So we're following this prince named Prince Tyrion, or this king named King Tyrion, and the discovery that two animals within Narnia have decided to fake pose as Aslan and start directing the animals and the people in scheming into trying to create this world that they want to be created. So it's kind of like this battle of good versus evil. Um, where is Aslan? Of course, some children come back into the story to help out in this battle and this war. And then we have the final completion or ending of the story. So this book was OK. I liked it better than Layla, but it wasn't great. It wasn't my it was not my least favorite of the series. I think The Boy and His Horse was my least favorite still. So this is my second least favorite book in the series. I just found that it didn't have the magical Narnia type vibes that I usually found in some of the earlier books like The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. It was missing some kind of like whimsical element. It was really dark. There was, of course, the usual sexism that he has in his novels. This is a book of its time, so it doesn't age well. But our female characters are kind of watered down and portrayed as like weak. And I don't know, you know, that's to be expected in his books, unfortunately. But we do get the return of a bunch of different characters that we haven't seen throughout the series. So I did like that. I did like the magical imagery that was painted in the end of the book. Um, but I just felt like my one huge, huge disappointment was the resolution and treatment of one of the main female characters. I'm not going to say who, but they really, he really did her dirty. Uh, it, it just did not come together for me as a series conclusion. If I were to reread the whole series again, I, I don't think I would bother to read this book. I, I would leave off at like maybe Voyage of the Dawn Treader. That was my favorite and I thought that ending was really nice. But overall, it was a little bit of a disappointment. Not horrible, but I just, it, it didn't have the magic of Narnia that some of the earlier books had, personally. Next, we have an audiobook I listened to called One, Two, Three by Lori Frankel. And this book follows the story of three different triplets sisters that are living in this town called Bourne, where about 20 years ago, a chemical plant had released a, a chemical into the water, which resulted in a, lo a lot of, um, birth defects and episodes of cancer 
and it was kind of brushed under the rug the chemical plant shut down the people left and but then we're left with this town that are reaping the effects of this for years and years to come so we're following these three triplets named mab monday and mirabel and their mother nora um, as as they sort of investigate what happened there's a nora has filed this class action lawsuit against this chemical company and ultimately descendants of this family end up moving back into the area to try to reopen the plant so what I did like about the book was that we had some really nice representation of a neurodivergent character and as well as a physically disabled character. So as far as the th three triplets go, they're 16 years old. We have Mab, which is kind of your ordinary everyday teenager just going through life, having crushes, studying for the SATs, just trying to find her place in the world. Then we have Monday, who's our neurodivergent character. She is very quirky. She has so many interesting thoughts. She's very particular. She likes certain things and doesn't like other certain things. She had a really interesting overview of her sisters and what was going on. And then lastly, we have Mirabelle, who is wheelchair bound. She's unable to speak except for a few vocalizations, but she has this speech generating device that she keeps with her that she can talk through. But we get her full inner voice, her full mind perspective, which I really, really liked. A lot of Mirabelle's story is shared with the perspective of Nora, her mother, because she is with Nora most of the time. So she's kind of relaying what Nora is saying and we're getting Nora's perspective and her overview of what's going on and her anger at this company coming back in. So we'll just leave the plot there. <laughs> um, and I guess what I, like I said, what I really liked, I especially liked the audio narrator for Monday. I think she did a phenomenal job creating this character and voicing this character. Um, I loved this, the way that they incorporated the speech generator device within the audio. That was really cool. That was a cool effect that they used. So again, I do like how they focused on family and love. And there's a really, really touching scene between Mirabelle and her mother, Nora, towards the end that, that brought me to tears. It was just, it was a beautiful confession of accepting yourself as you are and how you're perfect and this unconditional love between a mom and her children. So that was really great. Um, what I didn't really like about the book was that I found the plot to be really slow moving. Because we're getting three different perspectives, I felt like there was a lot of repetition in what was going on. I didn't feel like things were moving along very well. We're just, we were just kind of stuck with this problem. And um, towards the end of the book, through the audio, we're getting a lot of anger through the character of Mab and Nora. So there's a lot of yelling within the audio, which wasn't always my favorite thing to listen to if I was trying to just listen to this to relax. Um, and I did I just found it generally to be a bit overwritten. Um, it could have been shorter. I think I would have liked it more, but overall I gave it like three and a half stars. It was definitely enjoyable, but like I said, I found some pacing issues and uh, just maybe some issues with the audio in general. So that was one, two, three. So now we're getting into two of my favorites of the month. And first we have Black Cake by Charmaine Wilkerson. And this was the first book I've ever read by her. I don't know if it's her debut novel or not. She did a great job if it was. But this book was beautifully written, had such gorgeous prose. I really enjoyed that. So I'll just say that right off the bat, beautifully written. So this book is told entirely in the third person and we are following two different timelines. We're following siblings named Benny and Byron who for about eight years have not spoken to each other. Um, Benny, who's the daughter, something happened during one of their family holidays and she disappeared and she sort of left the family and never came back. So we're dealing with a very tense relationship between two siblings that are angry with each other have a lot of hurt within them and they end up having to come together because their mom Eleanor ends up passing away she had a terminal illness so she ends up passing away and Benny didn't get to see her until it was too late so we're following them and they are being told by the family's lawyer that Eleanor their mom had written this long recording of her history secrets that she kept from them, secrets from her past that she wants them to listen to together so that they can better understand her and why things were within their family. She also asked them to share this black cake, which is a traditional Caribbean dessert that she baked before she passed away and put in the freezer and she wanted them to share that with each other. 
She also um, tells them right off the bat that they have a sister that they never knew about. So we're getting all this information at once about what's going on and what Eleanor, what her wishes were for these kids. Then we flash back to the 1960s on an undisclosed island in the Caribbean. I pictured it as Jamaica, but it, I guess it could be any of them. So we're told, we're introduced to this character named Covey, who's a young girl living on the island, having a great time with her friends. She's an excellent swimmer. Um, and we're kind of immersed into this beautiful Caribbean culture of family and food and tradition. So Covey, right off the bat, we learn that she is biracial. She has a Caribbean mother, and then she has a Chinese father. So she is a mixed race woman living in the island, being raised in the Caribbean culture. There's some very interesting dynamics that we learn about right off the bat that deals with the loss of a family member and how she's dealing with that. Her father also does a few things that creates a very unfortunate situation for Covey that she doesn't want to be in and she needs to try to find a way to escape this particular situation. So right off the bat, I really liked the 1960s timeline much, much better. It had such a fast moving plot. I loved the writing, I loved the characters. I was excited to see what was gonna happen to them. With the present timeline, we're dealing with a lot of anger between the two siblings. So that was kind of like, mm, it was okay. But overall, the themes were really cool. There was themes about time and being too late and secrets and what happens to your family when you hold back secrets. Themes about cultures moving to different areas together to try to live and find a better life and kind of how you take your culture with you and your traditions and how you face racism and identity of who you are and what it means to lose your sense of self and to create a new identity for yourself for safety. So the character of Covey was just such a strong woman, such a strong survivor. She never felt herself to be a victim. She was always like, just ready to survive and deal with what life has given her. So I really liked that. I loved the love that this mother, Eleanor, had within her children. And just, it was like a feast to read, I guess you could say. The writing, again, was beautiful. My only complaint would probably be is that there were so many different points of views. We bounce around to a ton of different points of views. And that's just not my favorite when I'm reading. I kind of get lost a little bit within that. Also, I felt like the book tried to cover so many topics. So it was like such a wide range of topics instead of getting really deep into one or two topics, such as like racism or family, we were trying to cover like all these different things. So it got a little bit jumbled around. The like last part of the book I felt was a little bit more slower, but overall I did really enjoy this. Um, I gave it four stars. Again, the writing was beautiful and the overall story and love between a mom and her kids was really, really nice. So I did enjoy that. Okay, so the final book and my favorite book that I read in April was called Four Treasures of the Sky. I can't think of the author's name, Jenny something, but I'll put a picture over here, of course. Oh my gosh, you guys, this book tore me apart. This book was so good. I loved it. It was one of my favorite books of the year. It was heartbreaking, but it was, it's, I will never forget this book. I loved it so much. So Four Treasures of the Sky was a, is a book written about this young character. Thir the book starts out, she's 13 years old, single point of view, and we follow one timeline. So we're following this young 13 year old girl, girl named Dayu, who's her parents unfortunately were kidnapped or taken in the middle of the night one night. So she lives with her grandmother and when she turns 13, her grandmother sends her away for her own safety. She says, if you stay here, Dayu, you're going to get captured by these bad people. So we don't know what happened. We don't know what the parents were involved in and we don't know who these bad people are. So she essentially packs up this girl, shaves her hair off and tells her she has to pretend to be a boy and she has to go to this nearby city and try to survive on her own. So right off the bat, we're following this girl who's essentially homeless. She's living on the streets of this city. She's begging for food. She's trying to find work. And she does find a kind person who is a calligraphy master that she's able to work for and kind of have shelter with and learns about all these different teachings kind of in the background as we go. So one day, every day, he sends her to the fish market to pick up food for that day. 
So she goes to the, on this particular day, she's there at the fish market and the one particular person working there assumes that she's going to try to steal stuff and confronts her and says she's gonna call the police and makes this huge scene. And this man who's kind of overlooking the whole situation intervenes and says, no, 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 she, this is my nephew, he's fine. You don't need to call the police or get them involved. So he essentially saves her from being arrested. So he then kind of looks on her, looks on her with pity and asks her if, if she would like to share a hot meal with him. So she says yes, she decides to go with him. So they're having this meal and then the next thing she knows it, she wakes up and realizes that she's been drugged and kidnapped and is now being held hostage. So she's kidnapped for over a year in this small room, and this is right away, this is right off the bat. Um, forced to learn English and forced to adapt to what is going to become of her. What happens is that she ends up being smuggled over to the United States and she's forced to work in a uh, brothel as a child sex worker. So right off the bat, really heavy, heavy themes, heavy reading, um, difficult to read and heartbreaking. So what I did, so then the story goes on, I'm not going to get too much into the plot, but the story progresses until she's kind of a young a young adult probably into her um early like 16 years old maybe she gets to be so throughout this traumatic experience she creates in her mind this figure or this personality which is the folklore deity of who she is named after so we learn in the beginning that she really does not like her name dayu which i guess it, it's an ancient Chinese folklore person who just didn't have very desirable characteristics to her and she always hated her name. But this this person comes to life in her mind and sort of steps out of her and helps her through these really difficult situations. So as a coping me mechanism, she kind of created this little like guardian angel type figure to help empower her and possess her so that she can be strong in these situations where she's absolutely terrified. So one thing I really did like about this author is that she handled the sort of sexual trauma very well. It was not graphic or on page, which I really appreciate. She could have done a lot with that. And I'm glad that she chose to be more, I don't know, maybe it, it was just telling it from a younger kid's point of view that we're not going to get into the graphics because your mind kind of blocks things. So that was a plus. Um, the physical... The physical stuff that happens later on in the book though, I will say is a lot more graphic and difficult to read. So ultimately what I found so compelling about this book was this character's ability to adapt and survive and use her mind and use her resources and use her street smarts and her survival skills to really protect herself. It's really sad that she had to do all that, but she was such a strong character. And again, there wasn't a lot of this victimness or this poor me. It was kind of like, this is what my life is and this is how I'm gonna survive and this is what I'm gonna do. So the, we do see her make these really touching friendships you know, within the brothel and then later on when she, she has to live as a man in a different scenario, we see these beautiful friendships that she makes. And I think the author did such a great job of creating these beautiful characters that you just want to root for and love and also these really they're not even evil characters but they're these people doing evil things that you just cannot believe that this could have happened um, there's a lot of theming and focus around the chinese exclusion act which happened in the late 1800s i forgot to mention this is a historical fiction taking place in the late 1800s in china and then later on in the u.s so I never really realized the extent of the Chinese racism that occurred in our country at that time and just how horrible people were and how they could treat people that way. And, oh, like these vigilantes that just felt that they could go above and beyond the law and they were just coming from like this disgusting Christian place and just this awful mentality of white supremacy. So that was really, really hard to read. It was difficult, but... I think that the author did a good job of bringing it to light and throwing it in your face and being like, this is this is a reality that none of us really learned in school, but this happened to people and this is an important part 
in the Chinese American culture and, you know, just as, as many different um, minorities and less privileged people had to experience when they came here to the United States and that many are still experiencing now with um, the racism, especially with the COVID and the rise of the anti-Chinese racism that we have here. So absolutely gorgeous writing, a phenomenal, I think this was her debut novel too. I don't know, I'm not sure, but it was just a book that will stay with me forever. I really, this book is going to break your heart if you choose to read it. I'll warn you now. <laughs> and I think, I, I think this author just did such a great job of like just bringing your heart to this one character, this main character. It was, I mean, I really felt for her and I wanted things to work out for her. And I was sobbing. I was crying <laughs> during this book, which, you know, I do cry sometimes in books, but this one really broke my heart. So yeah, this author knows how to work a crowd. She did such a good job, such a great book but it just touched me in such a way that I'll never forget it. So that was my favorite book of the month. Um, I hope you guys had a really good reading month. I would love to know what your favorite book was this month or what your favorite book of the year has been. And I hope you enjoyed the video and I will talk to you guys soon.